Mike? Mike? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're running a little late, so we're going to get started. Anthony says he doesn't quite understand L.A. traffic because he's a New Yorker. Okay. Uh, on a personal note, I want to thank him for being here again at the USC Dornsife Center for the Political Future. Uh, we actually got to know each other electronically across a continent uh, when we were on television before the 2016 election. I confidently predicted that no how, no way, not in this universe or any other, could Donald Trump be elected President of the United States. Anthony resolutely argued the opposite. He was right, and I was wrong. I also predicted I was going to last 12 <laughs> days, not 11, so <laughs> I was wrong about that. But by the way, uh, I have to leave right after doing these introductions. It's not because I anticipate disliking what will be heard. It's because I have to teach. Uh, this event is in partnership with Procon.org, led by our good friend Kami Akaban, and with the Italian American Lawyers Association. And I first want to ask Kami to say a couple of words. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, we have been a partner with USC for the last several years. We are uh, honored and humbled to be part of the Center for Political Futures programming again this year. Uh, Procon.org is the nation's largest pro, con, and related research debate organization. Uh, we provide pro and con research so people can learn both sides and make their own informed decisions. We believe, like Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. Or like Art Brooks said, we don't need to disagree less. We need to disagree better. And what better way than to be exposed to different points of view like we're going to hear today. So again, to USC and to our panelists today, thank you so much. Great. Uh, we're being broadcast on Facebook Live today. And to introduce and moderate the panel, I want to bring on Mike Gatto, who's a former California State Assemblyman, uh, who also serves as Assistant Speaker Pro Tempore of the State Assembly and Chairman of several of the legislature's most important committees. We're also grateful, by the way, uh, to Mike because he was a legislative fellow uh, with the center last year and he was absolutely terrific for our students. I'm now going to get out of the way and hand this over to Mike. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Bob. So for those of you watching online and to those of you in the audience, I want to say greetings from the University of Southern California. Uh, today, in the name of Public Dialogue, the USC Dornsife School, Procon.org, the Italian American Lawyers of Los Angeles bring you a rare treat, and that is a discussion on the future of the Republican Party in the age of Trump. Now, this being California, the debate will be moderated by a Democrat, that is me. Um, and uh, I'm sure some of you are wondering, what happened? Did the California State Legislature, did the Democrats in the State Legislature pass a law taxing Republican airtime air and redistributing it to a Democrat? Um, the answer is no, uh, they did not. The, the genesis of this event actually uh, comes from the Italian American Lawyers of Los Angeles. Uh, we were looking for somebody to talk uh, very articulately, very uh, uh, in-depth on national policy, a prominent Italian-American. Um, we wanted somebody who could really dive into the issues. Uh, that eliminated Leo DiCaprio. Um, we, we next, uh, we thought briefly of a fellow named Michael Avenatti, but uh, I think he's a little bit busy right now. And uh, no, in all seriousness... I like uh, the first comparison better than the second, but keep, <laughs> keep going. In all seriousness, we are so thankful that Anthony Scaramucci has joined us here today, and he truly was our first choice. Um, he has had quite the storied career. He's the son of a construction worker, um, but he's the founder of a successful investment firm, Skybridge Capital. He's a successful broadcaster, a successful author, a philanthropist, and for about a month in 2017 was the White House Communications Director. Oh, it was, it was 11 days, Mike. You don't have to give me a month. <laughs> I was being generous. I'm fine. So I'm please fine. join I'm me. Fine with the 11 days. <laughs> please join me in welcoming Anthony Scaramucci. Hey, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. And on... My right, and also on his today, which is a little bit of ironic, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got Mike Murphy. Now, Mike is one of the Republican Party's most successful political media consultants. Uh, he's led campaign teams to victory um, in more than 40 races, including multiple Senate and gubernatorial victories, including, shockingly, here in California. Uh, he's advised such luminaries as George Bush Sr. and Jr., John McCain, and Mitt Romney. He's also a successful writer and a producer in the entertainment industry, and he's a fixture right here at the USC Center for the Political Future. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Mike Murphy. So 
So gentlemen, let's get right, oh, and by the way, there will be, uh, there will be time at the end for questions and answers to so start thinking about all of them. These gentlemen have both agreed most generously to take whatever you want to bat at them. It'll be live, no, no uh, screening of questions. So whatever you got, come at us in the last 15 minutes of the program. So gentlemen, let's get right into it. Um, you know, Anthony, I know uh, not everybody in the audience knows this, but you were sort of a late convert to, to Donald Trump. But you did just write a book, which I had a copy of, but uh, hopefully everybody saw outside. And this book, this book is called Trump, the Blue Collar President. And there are some very, very good points in this book. Um, frankly, there's some of the same points that Michael Moore, ironically, has made. Um, now, when I was a kid, the Republican Party sort of stood for the, you know, the country club conservatism that most people are familiar with, with John Rockefeller and George Bush Sr. So the question is, with this new Republican Party under Trump that appeals to the blue-collar American, is this change good or bad? And also, please tell us what drew you to Mr. Trump initially. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, let me just step back and one second about the book. I tried to come up with a controversial title. Um, so when I titled it Blue Collar President, I knew there'd be a lot of people on the left that wouldn't like that because the president was born with a uh, golden toilet seat. And so I knew people wouldn't like that. And then if you've ever seen the president's apartment on the internet, it looks like Louis XIV smoked crystal meth and then decorated the apartment. So, <laughs> so you know him personally. He is not a blue collar person. Uh, but what he was able to do is he was able to galvanize a very large group of blue-collar voters pursuant to what Michael Moore said and what I tried to identify in the book and, and frankly, a lot of my family members. So, uh, you know, I, have, I come from a family of blue-collar people. I have clamors and collision people, auto collision, auto glass people in my family, pizzeria people in my family. You know, there's a lot of Anthonys in my family. So on New Year's Eve, I'm Anthony Hedge Fund as opposed to Anthony Auto Glass or Anthony Collision. So... So those people voted for him. And so you may not like the president or you may like the president, but I was just merely trying to explain why. Um, in my relationship, I'll talk briefly. Uh, the president wanted me to work from day one. I was already working for Scott Walker. He said, okay, after I kill Scott Walker, will you come work for me? I said, well, I've got my money management firm. I've got a ton of my clients are with George Bush's brother, Jeb, and I gotta go to Jeb. And then the president looked at me or then the candidate I said, okay, fine, after I take him out too, Will you come work for me? And so I shook hands with them, and I, I stayed committed to that. But I didn't realize, and I've said this the last time I was here at USC, I didn't realize the dynamics in politics are so drastically different from business. I thought people that were on the same team with me, we were going to work together. But it turns out that, you know, you shoot each other, you shoot to kill in politics. Okay, so same question to Mr. Mike Murphy. Uh, well, thank you. First, let me just thank you for having me here. Thank Anthony for doing this. The part they left out of the bio is I'm also the idiot who blew $110 million on Jeb Bush for president, running the independent expenditure, so I apologize, but I have to be back at Quiznos in exactly one hour. Uh, it, it's weird because keeping with the spirit of our center, we can disagree agreeably. Anthony's a friend of mine. We've known each other in politics for a while. But I've been a virulent opponent uh, of Donald Trump since 1993. As I was working for Christine Todd Whitman, the governor of New Jersey, and he showed up in Atlantic City, and I, I took a disliking to him at that very year, and I gleefully hung on to it with the fury only an Irish guy can have the <laughs> nurse's grudges. Um, but as far as the, the Trump appeal, I think Anthony's on to something with his book. He was a different kind of politician at a time when people wanted to blow up the system. So what he did was he really overperformed with white voters who did not have a college education. And he just broke the meter on that, which offset the fact he didn't do quite as well as kind of normal Republican with a lot of other voters in our coalition who had college degrees. So, you, you, I mean, I predicted he'd lose too. I thought he'd lose the popular vote by about 4 million votes. And it turned out he shaved a million off that, and that was enough to win a pretty tight election. So I think the question here is going forward, what's the scorecard and what's the future look like? And that's a real debate in the Republican Party. Trump has a primary challenge now with Bill Weld. Um, I would not bet my life on that thing working out because uh, about half the party really, really likes Donald Trump, and it's very hard to primary an incumbent president. We, we Republicans are mean social Darwinists, so we have a winner-take-all system for delegates. You come in second, get out of here, hit the bricks, loser. Delegates go to winner. The Democrats all cried when old Yeller died, so they have a proportional system. So you come in fourth place, you get some delegates. 
Their thing can go forever, so it's kind of more fun. Ours is sudden death. But the very fact there's a primary challenge shows this debate has begun, and I look forward to chatting about it today. Okay, so we already talked about the working class and how uh, Mr. Trump was able to appeal to the working class. Now, one of my Democratic friends um, tweeted the other day, and he said, when Republicans talk about the working class, let's be clear, they are talking about the white working class. Um, they are not talking about the, the balance of the country that is not within the white working class. And so this next question is, you know, and we'll start with Mr. Mike Murphy. Do you believe that the Republican Party can survive what is at minimum a perception problem, that the party does not have enough strength and enough support with the growing rainbow diversity that is the United States in 2019? Well, I'll, I'll quibble with the premise. And again, I'm going to have a migraine tonight because I'm going to defend President Trump for about a minute, which is the Democratic argument, the most inconvenient piece of polling out there is that Donald Trump did okay with Latino voters. He lost them, but he didn't get wiped out. He, he, he performed okay by on the Republican scale. So the voters of color argument uh, against Trump in a wider sense is not quite as strong as I think Trump's critics would like. And he had the same appeal to non-college educated folks who, um, look, my view of the election quickly is it was a grievance election, <clears throat> which were people were voting to blow up a system they think hasn't rewarded them, full of Washington politicians they don't believe, and on both sides the energy was with grievance. Donald Trump, <clears throat> excuse me, he basically argued, look, we're getting killed in trade deals by, you know, tricky Chinese trade negotiators, and Mexicans are tunneling in on crime waves or taking our jobs away. <clears throat> My relatives in Detroit who were putting machine tools on flatbed cars to be sent down to Mexico, it resonated. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Bernie Sanders was making a grievance argument about, look, you want that PhD in aromatherapy candle making, and you deserve that PhD, but it'll cost you a fortune in student loans. But in Wall Street, there's a room with a guy in a top hat shoveling gold coins. That's the problem. That's Anthony, room. by the way, right? Yeah, there. Anthony's. <laughs> Anthony. I wish it were that easy. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to take all that money. And give it to you so you can get all those free PhDs. So when voters lose faith in the system, they vote grievance. So the, the issue is the Republican Party underperforms with non-Caucasian voters. So we're up against demography. That is a lousy fight to be in. And so does the Republican need to do better, particularly with the fastest growing voter group? Second fastest growing, Latinos. Fastest is Asian. We get killed by both, can't get arrested, yes. But the bigger problem we have is we're the party of old people. When the Republican army is on the march, you can see it's coming, slow but sure. If they ever outlaw use tennis balls, the whole thing will stop. Okay, we, Anthony, same So, point uh, is, that's what we have to fix, younger. Same question. I mean, um, has Trump been a positive? I mean, in, in this realm, you know, there, there's such a visceral hatred from so many members yeah. of non-white working class communities. Well, How can the party survive? Well, I mean, the, my first observation was I find people have to really understand what he did. He hijacked the Republican Party from the party's establishment. And so Michael was representing the establishment with uh, Jeb Bush, as was I. I was working for Jeb. So he took it from the party leaders that don't like him. I mean, raise your hand in this room if you think Paul Ryan likes Donald J. Trump. Raise your hand. Okay, so I haven't heard, I haven't seen one person in 50 places in three months raise their hand. So he stole the Republican Party nomination from the establishment. Then he reached into the blue collar voters. Maybe they were mostly white. I don't know. I haven't looked at the numbers. And he stole a good part of their base. That's the Michael Moore argument. So he's done two things recently. One is is the prison reform. Uh, he's trying to send a message into the inner cities that he is an available choice to them. Um, and this, the second thing that he's, he's doing, um, which I think may or may not work, is he's, he's trying to figure out if the policies of immigration – um, and I saw a number, and I don't know if it's accurate. Michael knows this stuff better than me, but I saw a number recently that he had a 52% approval rating with Hispanics. I don't know if you saw that number. Um, and I think by tightening the border, uh, it's had this effect of cutting the slack in the labor market, which has allowed for lower and middle class wages to increase, and African American unemployment numbers and Hispanic American unemployment numbers to be at historic lows. But here's the problem that the president has, in, in, in my opinion. Um, he's got great communication skills, but he goes into areas stylistically that I think really, really hurt him with people. And so it's almost like there's a, uh, um, 
he wants to make it very hard on himself. He'll do five or six great things. He's, he's, uh, it looks like he's getting a, a positive memo from Attorney General Barr related to the Mueller report. And then the next thing we're talking about is child separation at the border and we're shooting our foot off again. Or uh, somebody says something mean and nasty about him and then he'll fire out a tweet like uh, specifically uh, he called Secretary of State Rex Tillerson dumb as a rock on Twitter. Okay, and that's funny, and it may feel good at the moment, and maybe Secretary Tillerson said something about him that he didn't like, but the problem with that is that you've got all these white suburban women that are teaching their, and not just white suburban women, but you can just look at the voting numbers are going down. He got 52% of the white woman's vote in 2016. He's well below that now, and when they do the tertiary, the secondary and tertiary questioning, they don't like the bullying. And they just, they're trying to teach your kids about being uh, not bullies, and so you have this stylistic issue. And so I've said this to the president personally. I've said it on television. I'll say it to you guys. He's got a 7 to 8% headwind in his face on these issues. If he dialed back levels of his personality or softened his image like he did at the State of the Union address back in the early part of the middle of the first quarter, uh, his poll numbers go up when he stopped tweeting uh, during the Brett Kavanaugh thing. Now, I wish everybody in this room a very long and healthy life, but I also wish that you not become the next Supreme Court nominee, okay, because they're going to destroy that person. And so they're in the process of destroying Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, the president wants to win that. They tell him to stop tweeting. He stops tweeting, or less non-strategic tweeting. Poll numbers go up. So there's a style here uh, that is also affecting his re-election uh, chances in addition to some of the other factors. So I want to go off script for just one second because that raised an issue that just wanted like maybe a one or two sentence answer from both of you. But there's a debate uh, in my household and certainly among lots of people I talk to. Donald Trump, is he crazy or is he crazy like a fox? Now you've met him. You've no, he's both. interacted with him. Okay. Well, right. he's crazy. Well, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. But he's also. You heard it here. <laughs> he's also crazy like a fox. No, he's both. He knows he's both. Also, here's the other thing. Okay. You know. He is acting on a stage. Don't, don't underestimate that, okay? You know, I had a funny conversation with him one night. Um, it was after my appearance on Bill Maher. He, he had watched my appearance. He called me, and he, he said, you know, you're trying to explain to Bill Maher what I was doing, and he was cutting you off. And then he said to me, you know, could you please stop explaining to people what I'm doing? You know, and, and the point being is that he has, there's a method to what he's doing, and then he said to me, do you think that that's an act, Anthony? I said, what, what's her? What's an act? Do you think that's an act, Bill Maher? Do you think he hates me that much? Uh, I'm doing such a great job for the country. Do you think he hates me that much? I said, sorry, I have, I have no idea. He goes, ah, I think it's an act for ratings. And then I said to the president, I said, Mr. President, are you an act? And he looked at, you know, through the phone, he said, yeah, of course I'm an act. And the, the point being is that there is a style to what he is doing. If you think he's just crazy and not crazy like a fox, well, you're missing a lot of elements of that thing. And and uh, and he's going to surprise people once again because he's way more versatile than people think. And there's a lot of thought that goes into a lot of the things that he's doing that's uh, in a different dimension than conventional thinking. Awesome. Mike. I think he's crazy. I think he's lazy. I think he's unfit to be president. I think he's not intellectually curious. And I think he chooses to be an evil fox. Because the presidency of the United States is not an effing reality show where the big question is, do you fire Gilbert Gottfried or Sulu or whoever's on the show? So that is the problem. He's cheapened the office. In our system, the president is more than the prime minister, not just the head of the elected government. Like the Queen of England, you're head of state. You stand for things. You're supposed to be the tuning fork that we calibrate right and wrong to. And his behavior, which maybe is a prisoner of crazy narcissism, but often is often a choice, is a combination of cheap applause and, in my view, racist adjacent behavior. So I think you can make the political argument when they, when they sober him up and he acts sane, his numbers go up, which I agree with. That's true. But the larger thing is the moral stain on this guy and, frankly, on my party. Okay, so, Mike, how long have you been a member of the Republican Party? College Republicans, Georgetown, 1981. Okay, so Mike's been a member of the Republican Party for 38 years. And, uh, you know, it's probably the same time that I've been a member. Um, and so a lot of Republicans don't like him, well, particularly a lot of establishment, what I would call more academically oriented conservative Republicans. So Bill Kristol, as an example, would be a representat representation of that. 
But here's what I would say to my friends that are Democrats and my friends that are Republican that don't like the president. Pay attention to what happened and pay attention to what he's doing. Because if you want to beat him, uh, the number one recommendation, and Bill Maher interrupted me when I was saying it, but the, if you want to beat him, you have to stop calling his supporters deplorable, white nationalists, ethnocentrics. Um, I visited these people. I went on 26 different campaign stops. These people, in a 35-year period of time, we went from working class aspiration in the country, economic aspiration, to working class economic desperation. Okay, what the people want are jobs. They want opportunity, they want to better themselves, and they want to better their family. So you want to beat the president, you don't like the president, um, you have to think about what I'm saying. You, you can't go into these races saying, the people are deplorable, they're knuckle-dragging, white nativists, and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And this might it's be the one work. point that all three of us up here agree on. It's not um, going to work. But, um, okay. no, no, I, I'm not for attacking his supporters. It's much more fun and accurate to attack him because he's the one making his choices. No, but there's an there's – And the Republicans and in the audience are all thinking that Democrat, like the economy, he's lost control of the, the debate. Okay. But so, <laughs> so, 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 gentlemen, let, 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 well, let me let just me, say this okay, one thing because okay, I want right, to make this more point. Question. Just let me make this point because it's nuanced. Okay? Uh, Michael is attacking him, and there's a very large group of people in the United States that view intellectual elitism as a negative. Now, you may view it as a positive. And so when you're attacking him, he's an avatar for them. You see what's happening? I'm going to tell you one other thing that I'm super worried about for our society and not just here but all of the West. I'm worried about the politics of vindictiveness. There are people now that will cut their nose off to spite themselves if it's going to hurt the other guy. And so as an example, I'm going to vote to Brexit even though I know it's against my economic interest, but it's an anger vote, but it's also a vote of vindictiveness. The situation in, in New York, the Long Island City situation with Amazon, there's nobody that could rationally have argued that that was the right thing to do. Yet, there was a group of angry people in that district, and there was a group of politicians that were barometric pressure readings for those people. Blew out Amazon and $27 billion of tax revenue to the state of New York. So we're moving in a territory now that we need to move away from, and that's a left and right conversation, not yeah. just a one-way conversation. And, and I will say, I mean, there, there were people, friends of mine on the Democratic side of the aisle, obviously, again, I'm a Democrat, who, who, who told me that they were not going to speak to me again because I even was on this stage today because I had the temerity to actually participate in this debate, which to me is just absolutely crazy. But let's move on. Let's move on. Let's, the next the reputation of the two people around, I would agree with that, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised no. that you actually We're came. We're trying to ruin your career here, and well, I think okay. we've had a pretty yeah, good start. It's, it's been pretty good. I'm not done yet. So, so um... But, okay, so the next question, I want to transition to talk about Trump's effect on Democrats. And I want to ask this question to prove that I'm not biased and that as a Democrat who's moderating, I'm not just going to clinically probe all the divisions within the Republican Party, but we're going to talk about the divisions within the Democratic Party as well. I think anybody out there would agree that Trump has had a certain effect on the Democratic Party, that he has pushed the Democratic Party leftward, that we have profound divisions within the Democratic Party that have manifested since 2016. Uh, but when I read polls, I see that not every Democrat out there supports the more extreme left positions that, are, um, that are, some people in our party have taken. And also, there's a lot of Democrats who tell me in private that um, you know, they, there's just no way that they could support some of the more extreme candidates for president. So I guess the question is, you know, what do you believe, uh, you know, Trump, and let's start with Mike, what, what do you believe Trump's effect has been on the Democratic Party? Is this a positive or negative for both parties? Is it a positive or negative for America? Well, it's twofold. One, he said, go be a resentment candidate, it works. And be as stupid as possible in your messaging, it works. Just have an enemy. Uh, because we reward that. It goes back to cave paintings. You're always going to see conflict. He, he got seven times the cable news coverage than anybody else because he was not attacking somebody every day. So what is perceived as success gets repeated. Now, we don't know till the end of the Democratic primaries where over 30 million people are going to participate because of that proportional delegate system that goes forever if they become as crazy as the Twitter-obsessed media is framing it. But certainly the emergence of AOC, the Bernie support, there is total energy on the progressive left, and that is useful for Trump because it gives him exactly the foil he needs. So whether it sticks or not through the full primary, I'm not so sure. Uh, but yes, that equation, if it sticks up, w will help the president. I don't think enough to reelect him unless they nominate Bernie, which is possible. Uh, but yeah. Anthony? So, you know, here's, here's what I would say. I, 
my Democratic friends, I live in New York, so I have a lot of Democratic friends, um, they were excited to run against Trump. And, they, and the Clinton campaign wanted to run against Trump. And then the question is, you have to be careful what you wish for. My Trump friends who are advocating for the president, want the president to win re-election, are quote unquote, excited to run against the far left. And I'm worried about that because I actually think that the far left's message right now is way more galvanizing than people think because there is a tremendous amount of economic anger, economic desperation, and economic anxiety still in the country. And so what happens is that promise, okay, that socialist promise is a very, very compelling promise. And so I would just tell my Republican friends that are supporting the president, be careful what you wish for. And I will tell you this, during the campaign, and Mike probably remembers this, uh, the president said often, that then the candidate, that he was more worried about Bernie Sanders than he was anybody else. And, and, and what he would have said is that, that there was only two people on that stage in 2016 that identified the systemic problem that I'm describing, the split between the haves and the have-nots, the fractured social contract. The establishment people didn't see it. Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump saw it, and I wrote about that in my book. You know, that, and so I'm worried about the far left. I, I, I'm not one of these conventional theorists that says, oh, keep going further to the left. That will guarantee the president's electoral success. I'm worried because there's a lot of – look at the numbers that Bernie Sanders is posting, both from popularity, uh, the ratings on Fox News, and also the numbers in terms of what he's raising uh, into his campaign. Okay, so you talked a little bit about the coast, and that's a good segue to my next question, which is about the coast. Um, you know, there's a saying, as the coast goes, so goes the nation. They say it in New York. They say it in California. When I started in politics here in California, uh, you had a state house that was evenly split. The state assembly was uh, 40 and 40, or 42, 38, depending on the year. When I got elected, it was roughly 50 Democrats and 30 Republicans. The state assembly in California now is 61 Democrats and 19 Republicans. So I want everybody to let that th sink in. That is better numbers for Democrats than Watergate. And as you know, um, you know, in New York, the numbers are, well, you know, I mean, they're definitely skewed Democratic as well. So the question is, are the coasts a predictor of the future of the Democratic, uh, I'm sorry, of the Republican Party under Trump? Um, or is this just a, one of those seismic shifts like happened in the years with Nixon where the makeup of the country is just going to change dramatically and we're going to have different geography when it comes to electoral contests. Is that for me? Yeah, 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 you start. So, yeah. so you know, just quickly what I would say is that, yeah, there's, a, there's an anti-Trumpian vote in, in there. Um, and that, you know, what really worries me about those numbers is when you start to really shift a state like that, whether it's New York, <coughs> excuse me, or California, and you're creating almost like a one-party power system, um, you guys are studying politics here, and I've observed it, one-party politics leads to a tremendous amount of corruption because it's not only just I'm going to stay in power and therefore I can corrupt. They begin the process of defining corruption. And if you don't believe me, just go to what President Xi did in 2012. His first move as the president of China was to start an anti-corruption campaign. So I would love to see, even though I'm a Republican, I love to see a circulation of power at the top and a balance of power uh, because it's so, almost like a self-cleaning scrubbing situation where you're removing people and you're reducing levels of corruption. I just speak for my state. We have a $177 billion budget. It's very hard to understand on a per capita basis where that money is going and who is really being served by the money. And I would love to see an inspector general or a super accounting system account for line item where that money is going. Very hard to see, but we are in a one-party state and it's, it's very hard to prevent high levels of corruption. And I will say just, you know, having my name on the ballot, politicians pay closer attention when they have a tough race. They are more likely to go out and speak at events like this when they fear for their reelection. And if you create a system where only one party can get elected, it hurts that system. Well, Mike it, it moves all the politics into the primary where a couple of ideological bosses or in here, the public employer unions run California. Everything else is camouflage because it is a one-party system. And the problem is Trump is making that worse. To get back to my favorite old selling here, if you look at registration in California, we register by party. We're at the lowest in 10 years. We're down to 23%. Um, you know, it, it is bottomed out. We lost Orange County. Orange County, the beating heart of the Republican Party in California. Mitt Romney carried it, by the way, when he lost the presidency. We lost it and took a lot of congressmen down. But it's not just California. 
if, if you do the hard-headed political calculus, has Trump helped or hurt the Republican Party? And you do, and this is a phrase Anthony knows well, if you mark it to market, in other words, you take an asset, what can you get for it? You sell it today. In politics, that is election day. Everything else is talk. Election day, you find out what's going on. And every election day, since the day Donald Trump, to his credit, won, has been a bad day for the Republican Party. Every special election in the Congress, we, we got whacked in most of them. We lost the big governorships. There were 70 specials in 75% of the time in 2017. Democrats did significantly better than norm. In the midterm elections, we got our butt kicked the worst since Watergate. So the country's trying to tell us something here. They're trying to fire Donald Trump. The question for the Democrats is, will they get in the way of that by giving Trump something to work with or not? I don't know the answer. Okay, another question that, I, that I'm going to say should be a quick one, uh, just a couple sentences. You know, when you were coming up in the Republican Party, I'm sure probably you as well, uh, the Republican Party used to like to claim the moral high ground. Um, that was something that was very clear. If you look at the old debates from the 1980s, 1990s, the Republican Party would claim the moral high ground on a lot of issues. So two questions, and in a couple sentences, please answer them. Yeah. Number one, can the Republican Party claim the moral high ground when they've got Trump in the White House? And number two, what are the core values of the Republican Party as the party of Trump? Well, no, they can't, and that's the big problem. Because we used to be able to run against the road to serfdom, that the Leviathan of government would ruin people's lives. And in my day coming up, and I'll really try to make this short, I, I joined this thing to go fight the Soviets, 1981. I was a Russian area studies major at the Foreign Service School at Georgetown, getting yelled at every morning in Russian by a, a Soviet defector. Flew his plane over, threw the keys at us, I need a job. And we were for free trade, we were for the Atlantic Alliance, and we thought we were better than the left because the left was crushing people. Now I have to listen to this socialist crap, and I'm a right-wing nut, by the way, and think, where's our high ground morally? Anthony. Well, you know, listen, I'm obviously like I'm a practicing Roman Catholic, and ha happy Easter to my fellow Catholics, happy Passover to people that are not Catholic, and happy whatever to whatever you decide to be. <laughs> but I don't think either party has a high moral high ground at this point. I just don't. So I think that that's been a uh, leveler. So my short answer is no, the Republican Party can't take the moral high ground, but neither can the Democrats, and so I think that's a lever. I think what's, what's at stake right now is there is a question of directionally where we're going and is this system of capitalism benefiting the most people? And the answer is obviously yes, but we have to make some changes to capitalism to make it more inclusive. <coughs> Terrific. Okay, so I'm told that we're going to go into questions and answers after, or questions from the audience after this last question, so um, this one is just going to be a chance for the panelists up here to shine. I want to give you guys a chance to make your predictions for 2020. Okay. So, you know, obviously there's there's unique scenarios. I, I figure there's three there's three things, right? There's there's the 19 there's an 1860 or 1912 type scenario where you know the Republican Party cleaves in two, or for that matter, the Democratic Party cleaves in two. Um, there's you know I, the economy obviously has a big effect on uh, the election. Anthony's got. A, gazillion fulfilling dollars under management, so I figure that's something he knows a little bit about. Don't judge and, me, Democrat. Don't judge <laughs> I'm not judging anybody. I respect it. And so then, it is like labor union pension money that we're doing a good job on. I'm sure you know. are. I'm sure you are. And then the, the final factor, of course, is you know who gets the Democratic nomination. That's obviously going to have a profound effect on whether or not Mr. Trump is the president again after 2020. So those three, those three uh, you know, guideposts, give me your predictions. Me first? Yeah. So, so listen – whether you like the president or dislike the president, and you know, I'll be interested to hear what Michael says. If you're in a rising economy, it seems unlikely that a sitting president gets dismounted. Now, that could happen because uh, anything can happen in our country. The president you know, made it to the presidency. But if in a rising economy, and it's hard to predict what will happen back end of 2020, but, you know, if you look at our economic forecast, we're probably in at least a plus one GDP growth for 2020. And so you'd have to put the odds in his favor, but, you know, there's a lot of qualifiers. Who's he running against, and w how is he styling himself going into the election? So uh, one last thing, go to uh, thehill.com and read the piece I posted on Sunday about the freedom of the press. Um, and I wrote that uh, because I want, you know, I, I'm basically saying to the president, knock off calling the press the enemy of the people. If you want to in re-election, you've got to ca capture 8 to 14% of the people that are not with you right now. 
got to be more moderate if you're going to win. That's my honest opinion. Now, declared or undeclared, which Democratic candidate is your prediction gets the nomination? Okay, so I don't know your party as well as you do, um, but I think if Joe Biden actually steps in to the race, I think he'll win the nomination despite the creepiness and despite the Ukrainian situation and all that other stuff. I think that he would be the odds on favor to get the nomination. All right, Mike Murphy, your 2020 predictions. Uh, I think the president's going to lose. Could win, but I think he's going to lose. Uh, I think, and the Democratic thing is way too early to tell because the process defines them. The smart thing to do now is look at the voters and figure out where they're going to land. That said, I think it will not be Biden. I think he's going to fold like a chair at the end of the year. I think it will not be Sanders. It will be in the hunt all the way. And the three I would watch the closest are Mayor Pete, Beto, Klobuchar, and Warren. Hmm. All right, well, that's hedging your bets. So if you had to pick yeah. one. Well, who's yours? <laughs> oh, gosh, I think Biden. I think Biden gets a nomination. Well, the one problem with you know, Vice President Biden, he's male, he's pale, and he's stale. <laughs> so wow. you're male, pale, and stale. <laughs> It's going to be hard, but uh, story, leave, leave, leave Mike Murphy out of this. The, the Dems, <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. I'm not running. The Dems <laughs> tend to nominate young. And Joe Biden's great, but he's the Ed McMahon of the uh, Democratic Party. He's a sidekick, not a star, and they're looking for a star. Okay, so also, now I also said one last thing about your party. Sure. Below 50, they do way better. You know, Barack sure. Obama, Bill Clinton, yep. uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, John F. Kennedy. It seems like the Democratic Party, when they're picking a can the, the, the Republicans, they want people that are 200 years old that knew George Washington. You know, you got Ronald Reagan, <laughs> Donald Trump, and people like sure. that. But the, the Democrats typically do way better when they're picking people below 50. So Pete Buttigieg, yeah, that's, that's the prediction for both of you, it sounds like. All right, um, so let's open it up to questions from the audience. Um, who's playing Phil Donahue? Who's going to go around? By the way, the, the kids in the audience are like, who is Phil Donahue? All right, great. All right, go ahead. <laughs> the Mooch, thanks for being here. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, okay, so way, I like the nickname Mooch. So all my Democratic friends that love calling me Mooch, I am a Mooch. Too. You should have seen me at the University of Alabama last week. I was stealing everything out of the equipment room, okay? <laughs> they don't call me the Mooch for a reason. They had to FedEx it back to me. All right, go ahead. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, so to many people on the right, it is evident there has been an institutionalized agenda by the media to take down the president that is essentially unprecedented in modern times. So as someone who was comm director, I was wondering what was it like to be in the eye of that hurricane under that context? Mm -hmm. And then do you believe it has gone almost too far to the point that it actually helps the president? Um, yeah, I do. I think there's a refraction now, and I would, I would urge you to read the 700-word essay that I wrote in The Hill because what I write in the essay, I think I have standing. I, there were three CNN reporters fired for a fake news story that was written about me. I've been lit up on late-night comedy. I mean, Seth Meyers called me a human pinky ring. Some of my – you can laugh at that, by the way. I don't care. That's an <laughs> Italian-American slur, but it's fine. I, I was also a double-parked BMW. I thought that was a little bit funnier. But you know, I've been, so I've been lit up by the press. I've been tabloided. I've been on the front page of the New York Post. And so I think I have standing here. Okay, the press goes after the president and his alliance very, very aggressively. I think it has hurt the press in some ways that they need to be a little bit tighter and a little bit more um, research done on their stories. Uh, but I still stand with the free press. At the end of the day, it is a pillar to the 243-year-old American experiment. It is one of the main reasons why we're so prosperous, because the free press not only protects you from tyranny and holds people in power in check, but it has this wonderful thing that it does to our young people. If you can teach a person to speak freely uh, because you have the free press, they will think freely and they will go on and invent things like Google, Facebook, Apple, etc. In China, they tell people, I'm sorry, you can't say anything bad about President Xi, and you're limited as it relates to censorship to the websites that you can traffic on. It has a limiting effect to their creativity. And so no matter what happened to me or what happens to the president, I think it's very, very important for all of us to stand with the free press. And I, I want to add something to that uh, real quick because, um, you know, this, hopefully all of you are feeling the same thing I am, which is when um, – uh, when Anthony gave the answer about uh, his conversation with the president, I was thinking, this is amazing. We are hearing something that will be in the history books someday. We're hearing it here first, and that is really tremendous. I'm curious. There's a famous, uh, famous uh, article about you where you were portrayed as cursing and saying a lot of things. And as a politician myself, I've given interviews like that on background to the media yeah. where I am myself, and I sort of talk freely, and I might throw in some F-bombs and whatever else. But there is an agreement that this is on background or off the record. 
I am curious, was that interview given on the record or was so it given on first background? Of all, raise your hand in this room if you've never said a curse word. I want to see the show of hands your entire life. There's one gentleman here who's never uttered a curse word, okay? So we found the mendacious person in the room. So, so here's the thing, okay? That was a guy uh, who I talked to. I write about it in the book. That was a guy whose father, Frank, was friends with my dad for 50 years, and he was an Italian-American from the town over from me. Did I have an agreement with him where I picked up the phone and said, hey, this is on background or this is off the record? I did not. You can listen to the recording. Um, but I did think in the spirit of a 50-year family relationship that I was talking to him in a very jocular way. He was also asking me if I would accept a profile of myself in The New Yorker, in which point I said, you know, I'm not as self-promotional as Steve Bannon. And then I said something stupid and regrettable, but I didn't think it was going to be posted on CNN the next night. When I called him the next day and he said he was running to CNN with a tape of me and that he had taped me, I said, I'm going to lose my job. There's no way that the president or John Kelly is not going to fire me over that. So why are you being so transactional? You know, we're two Italian kids from the same neighborhood. Why are you doing that to me? He said, it was a big story, and uh, I'm running with the story. And I said, okay, so I knew I was losing my job. But let me tell, say something to the young people in this room. I never once blamed anybody for my firing than myself. Uh, people say to me, well, you got fired. Yes, I got fired. I did something stupid. I trusted somebody that I shouldn't have trusted. In Washington, if you want a friend, buy a dog, right? That's what Harry Truman yeah. said. Even the dogs bite now in Washington, just so everybody <laughs> knows. But my last point is, if you're a young person in the room and you're making a mistake, own the mistake. Be accountable for the mistake. Don't pass it on or do the scarecrow thing where you're pretending it wasn't your fault. So, you know, John Kelly and I have actually built a pretty nice relationship. He fired me. He'll be my keynote speaker at our conference next uh, month in the early part of May. And when I called John Kelly to patch it up with him, I said, you know what? I put you in a tough spot. I put the president in a tough spot. You fired me. You're probably mad at me. I'm a little mad at you, but let's bury the hatchet. We're both Americans, and you're a four-star Marine, and you're also a Gold Star family member. And so for me, this is a message to young people. I made a terrible mistake. It cost me my job. Number one, own it. Number two, forgive yourself. I'm not waking up in the morning kicking myself for the mistake. I'm going forward with my life. And one note, lighthearted note, when the president called me after Kelly fired me, he said, are you okay? I said, relax. You made me as famous as Melania and Ivanka. I didn't have to sleep with you or be your daughter. So we're just fine. <laughs> you know, and, at, and at the end of the day, don't walk out of the fight because you did something stupid either. Well, a couple more points on that, and we're, I want to see next hands for the next question. But one of the things that struck me with that is, um, you know, I've heard you speak today, first day we met. I'm on the other side of the aisle. We disagree on a lot of things. But one thing I have to admit is you are a very intelligent person, and you're very thoughtful. And that's not something that I expected to be saying today. But the way that you are portrayed, no, 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 I'm, se I'm serious. And, but the way that you are portrayed I, I, I in the media I don't mind. is of inaccurate. They, we have to it's they're gonna, they're gonna t but you have to understand, Congressman, they're, they're going to two-dimensionalize people like me. They, they want to silence my voice because it may be an effective voice. It may reach some people and pull them across. So I, I get it. The, the Washington game is demonize people like me, two-dimensionalize them, and then build a shame box, and they want you to sit in that shame box with a dunce cap on. For sure. And I'm not doing it. But no, I just one, okay. one thing Mike's in defense of the media here, because I struggle with them all the time in my career as well, they often are culturally alienated to Republicans, so they have an instant hostility. But the president lies every day, and that makes it a little hard to cover him. And the president personally attacks people. And the president, because he lacks character, filled the White House, not all, there's some good people who went to work for him, particularly on the national security side, for the right reasons. He's driven most of them out. But he's created an even worse swamp than the Washington norm in his own staff world. Again, so his I, choice. I, I, don't, you know, I don't want to debate Mike up here. I have a lot of respect for him. I would disagree on the edges of that. I'm sure that the, the people that have hurt the president, frankly, the most are the RNC establishment guys that went into the – White House to hurt the president. And they also wrote these anonymous letters about him. And so now you're putting him in a really tough spot where he can't discern between who he can trust and who he can't trust. So, so you know, some of it's his fault, uh, yeah, but some of it is also the way the thing got organized in the beginning. Okay, let's go to more questions. There's a young lady with a Harvard Law shirt on. Interesting choice. All right, great. Right, right. Hi, thank you both for being here, by the way. Well, all three of you, thank you. Um, my question is in regards to President Trump's promise to 
um, work with Robert Kennedy Jr. back in, I think it was January of 2017, he promised to form the, R we called it the RFK Commission, um, to form a task force to study uh, vaccine safety. But then it's sort of rumored that Hope Hicks pulled the plug on that whole idea. Right. So, you know, the health freedom community, the parental rights community, Everybody's really wondering when is the safety, you know, task force mm -hmm. going to be formed? Do you have any you know information about that? About that? I, I have to confess to you that I don't know enough about it, so I don't want to just start randomly commenting on it. So, I mean, I can try to find out. I'll give you my card, and, and we can talk afterwards, but I just don't know enough about it. Okay, thank you. And anything from you, Mr. Murphy? You know, I started back in 92 when I started hearing from people who were getting stiffed on contractor bills in Atlantic City. I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them on anything. <laughs> all right, next question. Let's go. Next question. We've got, I see, uh, there's one in the back. Well, all right. All right. Back there. Away. Here. All right. <laughs> want to take it? All right. Thank you for coming to USC. I really appreciate it. Um, so we've been in a trade war agreement with China for a while now. We've had... You know, I think Q4 of 2018 was pretty scary for a lot of people. A lot of economists are projecting a future recession in the next few years, um, along with an inverted yield curve. Do you expect Donald Trump... Finance major. Woo. Minor, actually. <laughs> yeah, all right. Working a break in. Um, do you trust Donald Trump to effectively deal with the China situation, and especially talking with Powell and all the comments he's been making to avoid a recession? Okay, so it's multi-layered. I'm going to talk very quickly. I think we get a deal done with China. I suspect it'll get done before the end of June. I know the president pretty well. He's a superstitious guy, and he's going to want to start full campaign mode like he was June of 2015. He's going to want to go full campaign mode June of 2019. So I predict that deal gets done. The deal will be a good deal for the United States, but it won't be a great deal at the end of the day. Uh, what state and treasury will tell you and people that really study trade, we are the world's leading economy and we're still trying to pull millions and millions of people out of poverty in China. And so even though uh, the Western media likes to write about the threat of China, there's a lot of fragility in the Chinese economy. And so uh, some snarky CNN analysts will say, well, the deal is not as good as the president said, but I predict it will be a good enough deal and we'll be able to advance both economies and we need a strong bilateral relationship with China. Uh, Jerome Powell, I think Jerome Powell is his own person. Um, and so I predict that uh, Jerome Powell will lead the Fed the way he thinks it's appropriate, irrespective of the president's uh, tweeting and commentary. One thing I'm certainly worried about, as I know you probably are because you study this stuff, is that interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy are weakening. And so the, Jerome Powell moved from a lockstep movement of rates to a economic data dependency move because of that. And so one last thing, I'm worried about it. You're borrowing a trillion dollars very late cycle. We're in the 12th year of an economic expansion. These cycles typically go eight years. You need 400 basis points of monetary stimulus to smooth out the sharp edges of a recession. The overnight rate right now is 250. So the Fed's in a box. They want to raise rates to protect the economy and smooth out the recession, but they're also seeing underlying softness. And so for me, um, I think they'll stay where they are right now. You likely will not get a recession until after the 2020 election. It's as fast as I could say it. Uh, I'll Mike. just quickly say American politics has been in this stupid world on trade for three years. The deal we really needed geopolitically and for other reasons was the Trump Pacific, you know, TTP. Hillary was against it. Trump was against it. The steel thing is bad for American workers. It's good for a couple of steel mills. It's bad for everybody who consumes steel and manufacturing. But I agree with Anthony. I think this madness is going to come to a landing because the president's ready to back off a little and just declare victory, and the Chinese are being hurt by this. So in the end, net-net, I think it will be more pain than gain, but we'll find out, and I think it will come to when, a landing. When, when both parties need a deal to happen, a deal typically happens. Yeah. And both parties right now need that deal to happen. So. All right, next question Hello. Um, I know at the beginning you briefly mentioned about Bill Weld. I'm a little curious if you guys think um, him entering running against the president could have any effect. Traditionally in the past there's been examples where a sitting president facing a primary challenger, they have lost in the general. Right. So. Well, look, quickly, I, I mean, I'm, I sent Weld some money because I like the guy. I think it's tough simply because, one, it's hard to beat an incumbent president. 
to our city. Trump will just go to South Carolina and say, I'm starting here, you know, and go crush him there. But I wish him all the best. The media will get more excited about it than the primary voters will. Though in most polls, about 35 to 40 percent of primary voters in the Republican Party are fine with the primary. Trump doesn't have quite the lock, people think, but he has enough of a lock. Your point is key, though. When a president has enough political trouble that a, at least a semi-credible primary pops up, they normally win the primary. But it's an indication they're in big trouble in the general. Now, history doesn't dictate the future, but that's been the pattern. Uh, you know, so I think Bill Weld and the president are exactly the same in terms of personality and policy. And so I'm recommending a hair color dye change for Bill Weld so that we can <laughs> differentiate between the two of them. There we go. All right, next questions. Hi, uh, thank you both for coming. Um, I was just wondering what you think about the white working class vote that switched towards the Republican Party last cycle. Do you feel that is something that he switched back to the Democratic Party, or do you believe that's a generational shift um, that won't be changed? For if the Dems play their cards right, and who knows? Hillary had a lot to do with electing Trump. Um, but if they play their cards right, yeah, you look right now, there are two things the Democrats have going that they could screw up. One is on that age point I made earlier, if you get the insurance company computers out and you take a look at the electorate, you know, in 2020, and you give Trump the exact same share, but you take away the old people who died and the young people who hate Trump are added to the thing, Trump loses narrowly. So the, the, Trump's got to do better than he did last time with somebody. And if you look at my home state of Michigan, where I've done a lot of politics, it's, uh, it's pretty bumpy for Trump there. He's definitely declined. He's doing a little better in Wisconsin. So we just don't know yet. But the early trends are not getting better. You look at a lot of districts. Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh area, six-point Democratic district. They just won it. The D's do. I mean, six-point Republican Trump district. So <clears throat> early signs are rough. He's got to do better. We'll see if he can. Does any, anybody remember where they were on October the 7th, 2016? Anybody remember that? Now, let me tell you where I was. Okay? It was a Friday night, and Hope Hicks called me and said, did you see it? I said, no, I didn't see it. Then she sent me a link. That was the Access Hollywood night. Is everybody starting to remember it now? And so on October 7, 2016, if you were standing around uh, and you were a conventional person, a non-conventional person, whoever you were, you didn't think Trump was going to win. And, and, and let me tell you something. I've only seen the president apologize three times. He apologized once that night to Melania Trump and the American people, 11.58 p.m. I saw him apologize to Prime Minister Theresa May last summer when he said, I'm sorry, I went and did that tabloid. And the third time was he apologized to Pocahontas, the original Pocahontas, for comparing her to Elizabeth Warren. So those are the three times that he apologized, right? And so you would say to yourself, this guy's going to lose the election. Yet, on November the 8th, he won the election. So I, I just say, don't count the guy out, okay? This guy is a, he's got a lot of versatility that people don't anticipate. He's a little bit of a Swiss army knife. Uh, the trends don't look great right now, but we're, what are we, Michael, 18 months away? I don't know, 19 months away? Long time. Okay, so a month away, I would have told you he's going to lose by 10, possibly 15%, and he won the election. So don't count the guy out. Don't underestimate him. If you're a Democrat in the room, you want to beat him, remember what I said. Make it a fair fight. Go after those blue-collar workers that have felt a vacuum of advocacy for at least a generation. On both, both sides, for establishment Republicans and establishment Democrats, have left that space open, and that's something that the president went into. Hard. I will say that is true, but there's one big difference besides demography. People have experienced Donald Trump now. The novelty factor of, oh, art of the deal, he's going to make everybody work together, that's all gone. That's why they've been trying to fire him in every election since he was elected. We have time for one more question. Um, we've had a lot of talk about the media today, and uh, we're joined. And, and as everyone knows, this event was open to the media, and we're joined with a mem by a member of the media, and that's Natalie Brunel from ABC. Am I right? And a USC adjunct. Well, there so you go. All right. I'm, I'm from here as well. Um, I have two questions. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Um, how much longer do you think a two-party system can hold? Is my first question. Long time. It's distribution. You ever had Dasani water? You know, you like Dasani water? Nobody likes Dasani water, but it's everywhere because it's the water of the Coca-Cola company. When blockchain works and you can vote on your phone, which will come one day, uh, if we're not all working for the Chinese by then, you'll be able to have a lot of parties and a lot of choices. But right now, the independent thing, 
the system, the distribution system, cannot match the voter demand. So you're stuck with two-party for a while. So, you know, I probably, you know, less experience on this. I'd probably say differently than Michael. 42% of the registered voters now are independents. And so that's telling you that there's been a weakening of both those parties, and that also explains the Trump electoral success. So, But here's the thing. After the Ross Perot intervention, both parties tightened up aggressively. If you look at the civil procedure necessary to go into an election, they tightened up aggressively. This is a very tight duopoly. It's almost impossible for an independent to split the seam and go in there and, and win an election. So uh, I think it's at least a generation away before you see any type of introduction of that. Second question. We obviously hear in the media about a strong economy, but that's set against the backdrop of some shocking wealth inequality, income inequality. The Financial Times yesterday reported on CEO pay being about 254 to 1 on average. So what is the Re Republican Party doing to address wealth inequality? Let's start with Mike. Well, um, first of all, p people don't vote on wealth inequality. They vote on the perception of their own wages. And even though the unemployment rate is really low, people are unhappy because they perceive, and this has been true for 20 years under both parties, their money doesn't buy what it used to, so they have to work hard. That makes them lose faith in the institutions of the American dream that are supposed to move them up if they work hard. That means they start voting for cranks like Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. That is the spin cycle we're in. Now, on the president's side, the Republicans will say, we've had strong growth, true, we have low unemployment rate, true. That should drive up wages, which is what makes people happy because of the labor market. And that started happening, but slowly. So my friend Mitt Romney would say, the Republican Party ought to support a higher minimum wage. I'm for that. Uh, some in the party are. Others aren't. So I think in, uh, Anthony can speak for the, the Trump White House more than I ever can. I've been banned from that zip code. But growth means higher wages solves a lot of problems. Anthony. So I would encourage you to read Doris Kearns uh, Goodwin's book, The Bully Pulpit, because uh, if you go back to the 1890-1910 period of time in the United States, it's a very similar experience. It was the age of the robber batterns, and they were plundering the society, and the shift of economic rent to capital versus labor was enormous. And so Teddy Roosevelt, who I'm not in love with because of what he did to Italian-Americans, but you know, we can go into that later, um, but he did have a great idea, and he was actually the father of progressivism. That's been hijacked by the left today, but what Teddy Roosevelt put in place was a economic contract, and he set it through the bully pulpit in the news cycle, and he shamed these people into redistributing. You know, Henry Ford, whatever you think of him, like him or dislike him, he had a great line. He said, I'm going to pay the people in my assembly lines enough money so, they so that they can afford, afford the car afford. that they're worth. See, and that is the understanding of a good elemental social contract. He, he also understood if I've got a good school system surrounding my workers and they're in a nice house and they've got their car, they're not coming after me with a tiki torch and a pitchfork. And so this economic split, it may not affect the day-to-day -day vote, but it's hurting the social consciousness of America. Um, I submit to all the people in this room that have wealth uh, to really think about this and really think about how you can close the gap uh, in, in the ways that you can because you don't want the country to end up like Latin America where you're living in your Bob wired security compound in your McMansion while your fellow neighbors are struggling. And so to Michael's point, it may not affect the vote today or tomorrow, but it is hurting and it is fracturing the society and it's done it before. And so we really need really good political leadership to start to pull it back together. All right, well, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for being up here. Um, I don't know about you in the audience, but I learned a tremendous, tremendous amount. And let's give a standing ovation for these guys standing. for being here. Standing ovation for being here. And a, um, can, I, can, I wait, can I say one comment about my book? I, I, I wrote an international bestseller, and if you don't believe me, come into my basement. I'll show you every copy that I had to buy. So I've got free books outside, just the rule with the book. It doesn't have to go to your house but it can't come back to my house. My wife is so sick and tired of the book, so please take one on the way out. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.